James Whitcomb Riley, Hoosier Poet, is made possible by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922 and proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. IU Credit Union, offering three IU Athletic Debit Cards featuring IU Hoosier designs. Available at all IU Credit Union locations. More information at iucu.org. IU Credit Union, we started a credit union and created a community. The Brabson Library and Educational Foundation, reflecting the Brabson family's support for innovation in the arts and education. The Hancock County Tourism Commission, promoting the cultural, historical, and artistic amenities of Hancock County for the enrichment of visitors and residents alike. More information at hcvb.org. And by WTIU members, thank you. Oh, hello. I didn't know anyone was back here. Oh, my goodness. I'm nervous every time I go on. I've been doing this now for 15 years, reciting my poetry on stage, and every time I'm afraid I'm going to forget a verse before I get out there. Ladies oh. and gentlemen, the Tivoli Theater proudly presents James Whitcomb Riley. Pardon me. It's my key. The first poem I will present to you this evening was the first to appear under my pseudonym Benjamin F. Johnson Boone. With the other poems written under that same signature, it came to form my earliest published book entitled The Old Swimming Hole and 11 More Poems. As far back into boyhood as my memory may intelligently go, the country poet is most pleasantly remembered. He was and is as common as the country fiddler and f as full of old-fashioned music. Not, not a master of melody, indeed, but a poet, certainly. And it was simply the purpose of that series of dialectic studies to reflect the real worth of this homely child of nature and to echo, if possible, the faltering music of his song. Oh, the old swimming hole, where the creek so still and deep looked like a baby river that was laying half asleep. And the gurgle of the water around the drift just below sounded like the laugh of something we once used to know. Before we could remember anything but the eyes of the angels looking out as we left paradise. But the merry days of youth is beyond our control and it's hard to part forever with the old swimming hole. Oh, the old swimming hole. In the happy days of yore, when I used to lean above it on the old sycamore, <laughs> oh, it showed me a face in its warm, sunny tide that gazed back at me so gay and glorified. Made me love myself as I leaped to caress my shatter smiling up at me with such tenderness. But them days is past and gone. And old times tuck its toll from the old man come back to the old swimming hole. Oh, the old swimming hole. In the long, lazy days when the humdrum of school made so many runaways, how pleasant was the journey down the old dusty lane where the tracks of our bare feet was a printed so plain you could tell by the dent of the heel and the sole. There was lots of fun on hand at the old swimming hole. But the lost joys is past. Let your tears and sorrow roll like the rain that used to dapple up the old swimming hole. There the bulrushes growed. and the cattail so tall, and the sunshine and shatter fell over it all, and it mottled the water with amber and gold, till the glad lilies rocked in the ripples that rolled. 
and the snake feeder's four gauzy wings fluttered like the ghost of a daisy dropped out of the sky, or a wounded apple blossom in the breeze's control as it cut across some orchard towards the old swimming hole. Oh, the old swimming hole. When I last saw the place, the scenes was all changed like the change in my face. The bridge of the railroad now crosses the spot where the old diving log lays sunk and forgot. And I strayed down the banks where the trees used to be, but never again will their shade shelter me. And I wish in my sorrow I could strip to the soul and dive off in my grave like the old swimming hole. My name is James Whitcomb Riley. I once told my first biographer, Marcus Dickey, that there is a chemistry in nature that is making the worst good and the best better. To this end, a biographer may give scars the same treatment distance gives them in the landscape. He may soften or spiritualize them, but never ignore them. And that's what I'll try to do as I tell my story to you. Many of the details I'll relate to you about my history come from letters I wrote to friends and family at the time the incidents took place, and they'll often be visualized by illustrations painted under my direction by artist Will Vauter. I was born in Greenfield, Indiana on October 7, 1849, in a log cabin that sat along the National Road. James Wickham Riley was born on the day that Edgar Allan Poe died. And that plays a, a role in the way James Whitcomb thinks about himself throughout his life. When I was four, my father completed construction on a grand two-story house that sat next to the log cabin I was born in. And this is where the family would live up until the time that James was 16. Gold was discovered in 1849, the year he was born. So this is what brought people starting to go out west, and so he would have been a witness to all of this travel on this main national road. Even though he was growing up in a small town, he, through them, was exposed to the world beyond Greenfield. Riley was not known to be a, a stellar student. I'm sure I can see him being the class clown. More often than not, you would find Riley skipping school and going down to the swimming hole with some of the other boys. I could coax pictures out of a pencil at an early age. This is a self-portrait I sketched when I was 14. And here is a portrait I drew of my dear mother. Elizabeth Riley was James's mother and she was really the one that encouraged the artistic bent that James tended to have. The Riley family were considered upper middle class. They were able to have help that came into the house and helped um, Mrs. Riley with the household chores. Some of the help that was here at the house included an individual by the name of Mary Alice Smith. She came here in 1861. Her mother had died and her father had basically abandoned her. Mary Alice had an imagination and uh, told the children weird and fanciful stories, and she became the inspiration for Little Orphan Annie. Now watch carefully as I recite Little Orphan Annie for you. You'll see specific locations in the Greenfield house I grew up in that are mentioned in the poem. Little Orphan Annie has come to our house to stay. Wash the cups and saucers up, brush the crumbs away, and shoo the chickens off the porch. Dust the hearth and sweep. And make the fire and bake the bread and earn her board and keep. And all us other children, when the supper things is done, we sit around the kitchen fire and has the mostest fun of listening to the witch tales that Annie tells about and the goblins that get you if you don't watch out. Once, there was a little boy who wouldn't say his prayers and 
when he went to bed at night, away upstairs, his mammy heard him holler, and his daddy heard him bawl, and when they turned the kivers down, he wasn't there at all. And they seeked him in the rafter room. And cubby hole. And press. And seeked him up the chimbley flue. And everywhere, as I guess. But all they found was this, these pants and roundabout. And the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. And one time, a little girl did all this laugh and grin and make fun of everyone and all her blood and kin. And once, when they was company and old folks was there, she mocked them and shocked them and said she didn't care. And this, to she who kicked her heels and turned to run and hide, there was two great big black things a standing by her side. And they snatched her through the ceiling before she knowed what she's about. And the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. And little orphaned Annie says, when the blaze is blue and the lampwick sputters and the wind goes woo, and you hear the crickets quit, and the moon is gray, and the lightning bugs in dew is all squished away. You better mind your parents and your teachers fond and dear, and cherish them that loves you, and dry the orphan's tear, and help the poor and needy ones that's clustered all about, or the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. A lot of his work that he writes is right from his childhood. He said he had a very vivid imagination and an almost exact recollection of what his life was like as a child. But we grew up quickly in those days. I was deeply affected by my mother's death in 1870 when she was only 47 years old. This is the first time that Riley felt compelled to lose himself in drink. Just three weeks after my mother passed, I had my first poem published in the Greenfield commercial. It was also around this time that I lost my battle with arithmetic. At the age of 20, I decided my public school days had come to an end. Probably an eighth grade education it was all James Whitcomb ever got. My father was never satisfied with any of the odd jobs I picked up after I left school. Reuben apprenticed him to a sign painter, and when he was done with his apprenticeship, he set up his own sign painting shop above a drugstore. And this was a profession that he did off and on in the early 1870s with a variety of different individuals. He had a partner, Jim McClanahan, at one time, and then he formed a group called The Graphics, and they ended up traveling all over the state painting signs. I was best known for painting ads on fences and on the sides of barns. He created a sign where a ladder and human figures and a dog spelled the words Riley. It really does show how ingenious he was. While he was painting, he was still doing his poetry. He was trying to submit them to different magazines and to different newspapers to get himself published. One of my advertising partners introduced me to Doc McCrillis. Here are two of the signs I painted for Doc after I joined him on the road with his traveling medicine show. After that, I joined up with Doxy Townsend's patent medicine concert wagon and traveled statewide. Being in a different town every night presented a young man with a lot of opportunities. He was kind of one of these ones that had a girl in every port. But the serious relationship during that time was this woman named Kit Myers who lived in Anderson, to whom he became engaged in the mid-1870s. Being the front man for the medicine shows bolstered my self-confidence. While staying with an aunt and uncle in Martinsville, I made my first attempt at a one-man show in an old district schoolhouse near Monrovia, Indiana. Apparently that wasn't very successful. I can describe the uh, audience as hostile. Despite my disappointing outcome with lecturing, I found increasing success submitting my poems to newspapers in the Midwest and was often rewarded with publication, but I never received financial remuneration from them. 
poets suffered because then they're basically their work was getting printed, but then they weren't benefiting from it. The first time I was paying for my poetry was for a submission I made to Hearth and Home magazine in April of 1875. I received a check for $8 for a poem titled A Destiny. He decided that he would send a couple of poems to the people he called his literary lights, the people he looked up to, foremost among them being Longfellow. Longfellow responded within a week. Not being in the habit of criticizing the productions of others, I cannot enter into any minute discussion of the merits of the poems you send me. I can only say in general terms that I have read them with great pleasure, and I think they show the true poetic faculty and insight. Yours very truly, Henry W. Longfellow. He felt tremendously affirmed, and I think that really gave him a lot of self-confidence. And I understand he carried that letter around in his pocket with him. That says a lot, doesn't it? If it hadn't been for Longfellow's encouragement, he may have quit at that time. So this was a very important thing that happened in Riley's life. In April 1877, I accepted a newspaper position at the Anderson Democrat. For the first time in my life, I was under contract at a regular salary, $40 a month. At the end of the first month, the weekly subscriptions had doubled and my monthly salary rose to $60. At the same time, he was continuing to send submissions to the East Coast magazines and continue to get rejections. And this is where he really starts getting frustrated because he felt that his poetry was good. But in order to be accepted, you have to be accepted by the East Coast papers and literati. Well, Kennard, uh, who was the editor of the competing newspaper in Anderson, they got into an argument about why Riley's poetry was not being accepted by the Eastern magazines. Riley claimed that it was because of those periodicals prejudice against Western writers. And Will Kennard said, no, I think they're being rejected because your writing doesn't meet that standard. Annoyed by this man's criticism and by the return of manuscripts from magazines, I devised a plan to win recognition in disguise. This was to write a poem in imitation of a well-known author and submit it to my unthinking critics as a newly undiscovered manuscript. And of course, he picked Poe because Poe died on the day he was born. A friend, the editor of the Kokomo Dispatch, undertook to launch the hoax in his paper. The editor's introduction read as follows. The following beautiful posthumous poem from the gifted pen of the erratic poet Edgar Allan Poe we believe has never before been published in any form. Our attention was called to a poem written on the blank fly leaf of an old book. Handing us the book, he observed that the poem might be good enough to publish, and if we thought so, to take it along. Noticing the initials EAP at the bottom of the poem, it struck us that possibly we had run across a bonanza, so to speak. Now, remember, I devised the Poe poem fraud simply to prove, if possible, that like critics of verse would praise from a notable source what they did not hesitate to condemn from an unknown bard. My scheme proved successful. And when that was published, a lot of newspapers out east, like the New York Times, New York World, were taken in by the ruse. Within weeks, the poem was published in all manner of outlets across the country, along with the acclaim it received from the judges of verse. Well, Riley's back here laughing because he's proved his point. Once a name of great renown was affixed to a poem that he wrote, the East Coast papers picked it up. And so it went, and went, and kept on going till at last the necessary expose. He took so many people in that so many people did believe that it was a Poe poem, that although he was momentarily disgraced, it actually set him up for his later fame. All of which is smiling material now, as I present to you 
the poem that was the object of my hoax, Leonini. Leonini. Angels named her. And they took the light of the laughing stars and framed her in a smile of white. And they made her hair of gloomy midnight in a solemn night of summer when my heart of gloom blossomed up to greet her comer like a rose in bloom. All forebodings that distressed me I forgot as joy caressed me. Lying joy that caught and pressed me in the arms of doom. Only spake the little lisper in the angel tongue. Yet I listened, heard her whisper, songs are only sung here below that they may grieve you, tales but told you to deceive you. So must Leonini leave you while her love is young. Then God smiled and it was morning. Matchless and supreme heaven's glory seemed adoring earth with its esteem. Every heart but mine seemed gifted with the voice of prayer and lifted where my Leonini drifted from me like a dream. The Leonani Poe hoax is a big part of the Riley legend. He lost his job at the Anderson Democrat and so he told Kit that he was going to break the engagement. He was kind of pushing her away. And this then, of course, is another time when he had some drinking issues. Again, I turned to my family and home in Greenfield for comfort. Once there, I found the sympathetic soul I needed. Clara Louise Botsford was a school teacher. She came to stay with the Rileys. Clara and Riley became involved because of their interest in literature and writing. I think he started to see that if he could get a group of people to come and hear him speak, because he could write the poetry and get it printed, but then in turn he could go and he could perform it on stage too. In other words, you're writing one piece of poetry and it's paying you twice. I had a request from the Kokomo Tribune for some of my dialect rhymes. So I created a new pseudonym, John C. Walker and put all these poems under the heading, The Home Department. He was not embarrassed, but he was trying out different things still, and he could still do that under different pseudonyms. It was with these John C. Walker poems that I established my reputation as a dialectician. My reputation as a lecturer continued to grow as well. In 1879, the first big show was at the Park Theater in downtown Indianapolis. I always felt that part of my lecturing success came from my ability to explain to my audiences where the inspiration for a poem came from. These setups came to be stories themselves and attracted so much attention that journalists reporting on my performances would transcribe the poems I presented and their introductions. One of my most requested lecture selections, My Fiddle, is a perfect example. The Old Fiddler. What has become of it? The dear old-fashioned fiddler of our childhood who occupied the one chair in the kitchen and beat such hearty time to his music on the bare oak floor. Oh, what a whole-souled thing his foot was. No dainty and inaudible pulsation of the toe, but a flat-footed stomp <laughs> whose boisterous palpitations heard high above the rhythmic patter of the dancer's feet jarred and juggled the little eight by 10 window panes at the back and thrilled the very china and the cupboard shelves. <laughs> there were no affectations about the old fiddler. His instrument was just a fiddle. He a fiddler. And for this homely reason alone, perhaps, it was the youthful listener felt the vibrant current of the tune in every vein with such ecstatic spurts on inward mirthfulness at times he felt his very breath sucked up in swirls of the intoxication <laughs> as one may feel it lost and caught up swooping down the breezy atmosphere in a long pendulating grapevine set the old fiddler whose deft touches either lulled or fired our blood in those days ah where is he? We wander wearily in quest of him. 
We do not find him at the banquet, the crowded concert hall, the theater. They do not want him in the opera. The orchestra would blush to have him there. In all the wide, wide world, he had not where to lay his head. And so the old musician journeyed on, simply because my fiddle, well, I kind of keep her handy, don't you know? Though I ain't so much inclined to tromp the strings and switch the bow as I was before the timber and my elbows got so dry and my fingers was more limber-like and caperish and spry. Yet I can plonk and plonk and plink and tune her up and play and just lean back and laugh and wink at every rainy day. But playing's only middling. Tunes are picked up when a boy, the kind of sort of fiddling that folks call corduroy, uh, <laughs> the old fat gal and rye straw and my sailors on the sea is the old cotillions I saw when the choice is left to me. And so I plunk and plonk and plank <laughs> and rosin up my bow and play the tunes that makes you think the devil's in your toe. <laughs> I was always a romancing, doulous boy, to tell the truth. A fiddling and a dancing and a wasting of my youth. And a acting and a cutting up all sorts of silly pranks. It wasn't worth a button of anybody's thanks. But they tell me, when I used to plink and plonk and pluck and play, <laughs> my music seemed to have the kink driving cares away. That's how this here old fiddle's won my heart's enduring love. From the strings across the middle to the screeching keys above, from her apron over bridge to the ribbon round her throat, she's a wooing, cooing pigeon singing love me every note. So I pat her neck and plink her strings with loving hands. And listening closest, sometimes I think she kind of understands. The Park Theater performance marked a turning point for me. With the positive reviews I received, I was able to launch my first successful lecture season. During the 1879-80 winter performances, I was running around Indiana like a case of ringworm. It was during this lecture schedule that I received an offer from E.B. Martindale of the Indianapolis Journal to become its resident poet. Judge Martindale tells him, you could still go out and start doing your poetry readings, but anything that you write that has the mark of genius on them, I want you to send them to me and we will publish them in the paper. My success on the lecture circuit was greatly advanced when I signed a contract with the Red Path Lyceum Bureau. Red Path managed the most prominent lecturers in the nation. He suddenly turns up as a headliner on the West Lyceum Bureau's list of performers and skyrockets to the top within one season. You had to be on a train and you were stopping in a different little community every single day. The lecture schedule was also adding stress to my relationship with Clara Botsford. Clara and I became engaged in July 1880, but my travel schedule made it more and more difficult to see one another. Although I had promised her marriage, my lifestyle and my financial situation made it difficult for me to tie the knot. No mind for law, no mind for business. He would, you would put a contract in front of him and he would just sign it and not even read it. And the problem is, is that this was where unscrupulous managers were taking advantage of him. I would take some breaths between lecture seasons to renew myself by writing poems. This is exactly what I did in the summer of 1882 when I created what was to become my most enduring pseudonym, Benjamin F. Johnson of Boone. It was more than just a pseudonym. He literally created uh, another psyche. One of the reasons why the poems became popular is that people in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, identified with the world he was writing about and, and I think felt affirmed that a writer who had some kind of reputation would take their world seriously. They were kind of country, folksy sort of poems. He wrote about small town life, rural life, and he did it in the language of the people. 
The poem's popularity led to inquiries coming in to me and the journal office for the poems in book form. The requests were answered with the publication of The Old Swimming Hole and Eleven More Poems. For Riley, having his poetry published in book form uh, meant to him that he really finally was making it as a writer. It was the first time that any of the Eastern papers or uh, Eastern magazines uh, took any note uh, of him. Throughout the remainder of the 1880s, my star continued to rise at a breathtaking pace. One of my most memorable performances took place at Chickering Hall in New York City in the fall of 1887. The International Copyright League presented a two-day event and I was invited to read selections of my works. I was to be on stage with a group of 11 distinguished authors. Riley was the least known among them. He was the sensation of the afternoon. Newspaper notices were extraordinary. He supposedly moved the audience to tears. The poem I recited that afternoon that seemed to have such a profound effect on the audience was known as Nothing to Say. Nothing to say, my daughter. Nothing at all to say. Girls that's in love, I noticed, generally has their way. Your mother did before you, when your folks objected to me. Yet here I am, and here you are, and your mother, where is she? You look lots like your mother. Pretty much same in size, and about the same complected, in favor about the eyes, and like her too, about living here, because she couldn't stay. It almost seemed like you was dead, like her. But I ain't got much to say. She left you her little Bible, read your name across the page, Left her ear bobs for you, if ever you come of age. All has kept them and guarded them, but if you're going away, nothing to say, my daughter. Nothing at all to say. You don't recollect her, I reckon. No, you wasn't a year old then. And now you're, how old are you? Watch out, not 20. When? And your next birthday's in April. And you want to get married that day. <sighs> I wish your mother was living. But I ain't got nothing to say. 20 year, and as good a girl as a parent ever found. Uh, there's a straw catched on your dress there. I'll brush it off. Turn around. Her mother was just 20 when us two run away. Nothing to say, my daughter. Nothing at all to say. That's when he gained overnight national fame. It was also during this time that my relationship with Clara Bosford finally played out. She thought I was giving her an endless string of excuses not to legalize our liaison, and as a result, her letters became increasingly accusatory. He told me then that the prof had heard I was your mistress, that he had the news from Greenfield that everyone so regarded it. Finally, in the spring of 1885, I decided to end my five-year engagement to Clara. She didn't take it well. This is most bitter, but a fitting finale to the beginning. Everything shall be as you desire, letters and all, I think I realized to the full how little of your life I occupied. He always said when he could, uh, when he could get the women, he didn't have the money. And when he had the money, then he couldn't get the girls. My partnership with Clara may have come to an end, but a new lecture partnership was just beginning to pay dividends. Bill Nye was a uh, well-known humorist of the time. They worked very well together. And it was very successful. They were booked constantly. He was being worked to exhaustion, and then they were being horrible to him, and they were taking all of his money from his work and not giving him hardly anything. 
For one performance in Louisville, Riley was discovered passed out in uh, his hotel bed, not able to perform. I thought I would die of shame. I just rolled over with my face against the wall and sobbed the plaster loose. My brother-in-law, Henry Idol, who was just beginning to take over my business affairs, came to the rescue and took me home to Indianapolis under cover of night. His Indianapolis friends and many people rallied around him and pointed out how Riley had been taken advantage of. That whole situation, I think, was a turning point in his life because he vowed at that point in time, my drinking is never going to affect my performing my work ever again. And it, and it doesn't. The Louisville fiasco forced me to realize that I needed to cut back on my lecture dates. This enabled me to focus on publishing my poems in book form. I was starting to reap the benefits of publishing with the series of successful poetry collections, but with the release of Rhymes of Childhood in 1890, I was branded for the rest of my life. With Rhymes of Childhood, those poems were so beloved and so perfect for orations that school children all over the country uh, learned the poems by heart, even though Riley did not consider himself to be a children's poet. It really did cement him uh, as a writer of children's poems, which uh, really is a small percentage, but what Riley is probably best known for. One of my most popular poems that appeared in that book was The Raggedy Man. Since it's also such a good example of a dialect poem, I'd like you to see how the spelling of the words in my dialect style would have appeared in a book as I recite the poem for you now. Oh, the Raggedy Man. He works for Paul, and he's the goodest man you ever saw. He comes to our house every day and waters the horses, and feed them hay, and he opens the shed, and we all just laugh when he drives our little old wobbly calf. <laughs> and then, if our hired girl says he can, he, he, he milks the cow for Elizabeth Ann. Ain't he awful good, raggedy man? Raggedy, raggedy, raggedy man. Why, the raggedy man, he is so good uh, he splits the kindling and chops the wood. And then he spades in our garden, too, and does most things that boys can't do. He clumbed clean up in our big tree and shook an apple down for me. And another and two for Elizabeth Ann. And another and two for the raggedy man. Any awful kind raggedy man. Raggedy, raggedy, raggedy man. And the raggedy man he knows most rhymes and tells it, if I be good, sometimes and knows about giants and griffins and elves and the squeegee come squeeze that swallows themselves. Why right by the pump in our pasture lot, he showed me the hole that the wonks has got. It lives way deep in the ground and can turn into me or Elizabeth Ann. Ain't he a funny old raggedy man? Raggedy, raggedy, raggedy man. The raggedy man. One time when he was making a little bow and arrow for me, says, when you're big like your pa is, ere you go to keep a fine store like this, and be a rich merchant, and wear fine clothes, and what ere you got to be, goodness knows. And then he laughed at Elizabeth Ann. And I says, well, I'm going to be a raggedy man. I, I'm just going to be a nice raggedy man. Raggedy, raggedy, raggedy man. With my books now bringing in a steady income, I could afford to be more selective about my lecture appearances. But in 1894, I couldn't pass on an opportunity to appear on stage with Mark Twain at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Mark Twain admired Riley. He said he was the funniest man in America. Mark Twain hated to appear on stage with James Whitcomb Riley. He was a little bit jealous of Riley's notoriety. Twain would only appear 
with James Wickham Riley if James Wickham Riley only performed his serious poetry and didn't do anything humorous. After the Madison Square Garden event, I returned home to Indianapolis. And in years past, I usually stayed at the Denison Hotel. But in 1893, I took up residence at the home of Charles and Magdalena Holstein at 528 Lockerbie Street. He insisted that he pay, you know, a boarding fee. You know, he wanted to share in the cost of kind of keeping the home up. The library was James Wickham Riley's favorite room. He loved being in this room. And it would be also another place where they do a lot of entertaining. His personal favorite poet was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. That's why there's also a bust of Longfellow in this room over on the right-hand side on top of the bookshelf. His favorite writer was Charles Dickens. We know from Magdalena that he would read aloud from Charles Dickens every Christmas Eve. The bookshelves in this room are all filled with uh, the books that belong to James Wickham Riley. And so we know that these are the books he liked, these are the books he bought, and these are the ones he enjoyed. The chair over on the left-hand side of the room was often called Poet's Corner. In this very chair is where I would often read selections of my poems for guests in the house. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock, and you hear the kick and gobble of the strutting turkey cock, and the clacking of the guineas, clucking of the hens, and the rooster's hallelujah as he tiptoes on the fence. Oh, it's then the times a feller is feeling at his best, with the rising sun to greet him from a night of peaceful rest, as he leaves the house bareheaded and goes out to feed the stock. when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. There's something kind of hearty-like about the atmosphere when the heat of summer is over and the cooling fall is here. Of course, we miss the flowers and the blossoms on the trees and the mumble of the hummingbirds and buzzing of the bees. But the air's so appetizing, and the landscape through the haze of a crisp and sunny morning of the early autumn days is a picture that no painter has the color in to mock. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. The husky, rusty rustle of the tassels of the corn and the rasping of the tangled leaves as golden as the morn. The stubble in the furries, kind of lonesome like, but still a preaching sermons to us of the barns they grow to fill. The straw stack in the meadow, and the reaper in the shed, the horses in their stalls below, uh, the clover overhead. Oh, it sets my heart a clicking like the ticking of a clock when the frost is on the pumpkin. and the fodder's in the shock. Then your apples all is gathered, and the ones a feller keeps is poured around the cellar floor in red and yellow heaps, and your cider making's over. And your women folk is through with their mints and apple butter, and their souse and sausage too. I don't know how to tell it, but if such a thing could be as the angels wanting boarding and they called around on me, I'd want to accommodate them, all the whole enduring flock. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. When he moved in in 1893, he brought a lot of his own furniture with him. So James O'Com Riley's bedroom has a lot of pieces in it that actually may be a little bit older than the home. His original writing desk is straight across from the doorway. That's where he composed many of his over 1,000 works of poetry. We also know that he liked to write in the bed here. Magdalena would write about coming up and finding him late at night, scribbling away on a little lap desk in his bed, surrounded by little scraps of paper. That's how he liked to work. 
that kind of family connection that he got here, that family feeling, was certainly very important to him. And it's, and it's clear in his poetry, he wrote so much about family, about childhood. Those were all very important things to him. Even though my poems reminded the reader of the good old days, there were several aspects of the country's increasing commercialization that helped fill my pockets. Riley was one of the first celebrities to use his name and his image with a variety of different products. This was everything from pineapple to coffee to rolled oats to vinegar. There were Little Poet cigars, and they had the Hoosier Poet name, and they had his face on the label. So he was getting revenue from the use of his image and his name and even his poetry through products. Pleasant old brother mine in those old days of the lost sunshine of youth when the Saturday chores were through and the Sundays would in the kitchen too. Riley was recorded by Edison Records so you could actually hear the Hoosier poet and hear how he sounds. So if you couldn't go to see him in a performance, you could buy a record and hear him. And all is well out to old and the Selig Polyscope Company purchased some film rights from Riley in order to make movies. It was thought that this would be of great interest because Riley was such a well-known poet. This is the only movie that you're going to see that actually tells the story of Little Wharf and Annie as we know her from Riley. After the turn of the century, I became altogether weary of the lecture tours and confined my poetry readings to special events. I recited at events like the dedication of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis and the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Even though he never officially had the title of Poet Laureate, he sort of became like the Poet Laureate, and if a prominent person uh, died, he would write a, a valedictory poem about that person. As the anxiety of vanishing youth began to creep over me, I often referred to myself as the homeopathic poet. I felt the cords of affliction begin to tighten. In July of 1910, Riley suffered a severe stroke. It was touch and go for a while, but he survived. He finally was able to walk with a cane. I had trouble talking, and most distressing to me was my inability to use my writing hand. My mortality became evident, and I wanted to be remembered for something more than just my poetry. The result was a $75,000 donation to the State Board of School Commissioners for the construction of a new library building in Indianapolis. For the next few years, my recovery from the stroke continued quietly at the Holstein House, except for my birthdays. The Indiana Federation of Literary Clubs spearheaded a movement for the celebration of my birthday in all the state schools. All the schools in Indiana celebrated his birthday, read his poetry on that day in the classroom. Between 1911 and 1915, the Indianapolis schools festivities culminated in front of my Lockerbie home, where school children would serenade me and present me with flowers. That celebration spread to the national level in 1915 when the U.S. Secretary of Labor called for a national observance of my birthday. And this is when you started having Riley Day all over the nation. After passing my 66th milestone, I was feeling so much like a boy that time seemed to promise many returns of the day. But my end was not far away. Riley suffered a second stroke July 22, 1916. They thought he would possibly recover, um, but unfortunately he did not and passed away. Riley was honored with a funeral in our state capitol building. There had only been two people who had that honor prior to him. He had a funeral cortege that took the body from Lockerbie to the state capitol building and there 35,000 people saw his casket in one day's time. Greenfield thought that he should be buried in Greenfield with other members of his family. Indianapolis did not think that Greenfield 
was a suitable location. The Indianapolis faction won out in part because the Indianapolis faction had money and designed a major uh, memorial to Riley on the top of Crown Hill, the highest spot in Marion County, Indiana. It was shortly after the death of the poet in the summer of 1916 that friends, according to the story, um, tried to figure out a good way to uh, memorialize the poet. The Riley Memorial Association quickly formed, and the first thing they ended up doing was buying the Lockerbie home. A physician named Lafayette Page who brought the idea that perhaps because Riley had so cared for poor children that instead of putting up a monument or a park that a hospital to care for all the children of Indiana would be a fitting memorial to the poet. So by far the largest amount of money came from the Riley uh, Association and its fundraising effort. It received subscriptions from school children, from Kiwanis clubs, from Rotary organizations all over the state. And it was always originally called the James Wickham Riley Hospital for Children. People today know it only as Riley Hospital, and they've forgotten the James Wickham part and that it was named for the Hoosier poet. We were marking Riley's birthday off and on with a variety of different things over the years. And then finally, they started closing down the main streets. And so now, it is the second largest craft festival in the state. It is a four-day weekend. It is one of the oldest fall festivals here in the state of Indiana. Today is our workshop on James Whitcomb Riley, who is a famous Hoosier poet. Little orphan Annie's come to our house to stay and wash the cups and saucers up and brush the crumbs away. I think for me, the value is the way he wrote and that I would want kids to know that there are many different ways to express yourself and that there's value in all of those different ways. And I want them to understand why he expressed himself that way and what it meant to people. He wrote the way that they spoke. Kivers or covers? I used to have when he went to bed at night. What's a cubby hole? It would probably be your best hiding spot. Do you want carnivores or child eaters? But they talked about this is the way they, that it sounds, but this is what it really means. He was a very important part of our literary history. Riley did reflect a very important uh, phenomenon in the late, late 19th century, early 20th century, which was interest in uh, children, uh, a sort of romanticism, a reaction against industrialization and scientific thinking. Poems are windows into time and place, and his were also. He certainly was a major literary figure of his time, and really Indiana's first celebrity, someone who really introduced to the country what it meant to be a Hoosier. Literary critics have not been kind to Riley over the years. What works against it now is that uh, dialect poetry is very out of fashion, and there is a charge of sentimentality that is sometimes, quite honestly, deserved. One of the strongest things about his poetry is that it does very well orally. It does, it's, it's meant to be spoken out loud because the sounds that go with it are part of the feeling of the poem. There is a special joy that some people feel in hearing a, a kind of literature, a genre of literature like poetry, be in the language that people speak at home or on the street. He was the most successful poet in the 19th century in America and perhaps uh, uh, worldwide. He was driven to write the way he wrote as a way to express the culture around him and I think that that's of tremendous value. Whether or not it translates is irrelevant. 
It was what it was for when it was, and it had value. For a DVD or Blu-ray disc of this program, or other WTIU-produced programs, go online at shopwtiu.org. James Whitcomb Riley, Hoosier Poet, is made possible by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922 and proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. IU Credit Union, offering three IU Athletic debit cards featuring IU Hoosier designs. Available at all IU Credit Union locations. More information at iucu.org. IU Credit Union. We started a credit union and created a community. The Brabson Library and Educational Foundation, reflecting the Brabson family's support for innovation in the arts and education. The Hancock County Tourism Commission, promoting the cultural, historical, and artistic amenities of Hancock County for the enrichment of visitors and residents alike. More information at hcvb.org. And by WTIU members, thank you.